So <laughs> Douglas was talking about how we could use uh, a bulk path integral, a bulk path integral that includes replica wormholes, Euclidean wormholes connecting different replicas. And if we did that and we do the calculation properly, then in simple toy models and also more generally, you can correctly calculate the full page curve. So you, you, you know, in our case, it goes up and then it flattens out when you have more entanglement uh, between the interior and the Hawking radiation for an evaporating black hole. It would, of course, go back down. Um, so that's pretty cool, I think. Um, but there's sort of more to information getting out of black holes than just calculating the page curve. Uh, in particular, um, if the information has got out, there should be a, some way to see that information by looking at the Hawking radiation. Uh, there should be some operator, some measurement we could do in the Hawking radiation that secretly is measuring stuff that fell into the black hole. Um, so yeah, um, the papers that came out early in this year by me and by Ahmed Netta, um, Don, Henry, Raghu, Wan, Ying, and everyone else, uh, if I've forgotten anyone, um, they had an answer to this question. And that answer was what's called entanglement wedge reconstruction. So what does entanglement wedge reconstruction say? Roughly speaking, it says that everything in between the Ryutaki Nagi surface, or the, the minimal quantum extremal surface, the EW surface more generally, uh, between that and your boundary region is secretly encoded in the boundary region. So in our case, we have two possible Ryutaki Nagi surfaces. One of them is just empty. In that case, everything in the bulk spacetime is sort of between the empty surface and the boundary of the spacetime. OK? And so it's all in the entanglement wedge of the boundary. No information has, has, has been come out in our, our analog of Hawking radiation. But when the RT surface is this non-empty surface at the horizon, then this whole green region is secretly encoded in the Hawking radiation. That's the idea, anyway. Uh, so how do you derive, if, if, if the Ryutaki Nagi formula, or the, the EW version of it, is derived using the replica trick, using all these papers by Lukovic and Maudicina and everyone else, how do you derive entanglement wedge reconstruction? Well, the answer's pretty simple. With the possible exception of a paper by Tom Faulkner and Ito Lukovic that unfortunately won't be helpful for us, Basically, what you do is the following. You start from the exact same calculation by Lukovic and Mauditina of entropies using the replica trick. Then you take that re calculation, and you get out your hammer of the last 20 years' worth of results from quantum information theory. And you take that hammer, and you start whacking those entropy calculations. And you keep whacking them until you mold them into what you want, which is entanglement wedge reconstruction. So that's great. I, I, I'm all in favor of proof by quantum information. Um, but in this case, we're trying to argue that even though it seems like this auxiliary system carrying the Hawking radiation knows nothing about the interior, actually it secretly does, we might want something more. Right? Otherwise, people could say, well, there's still a paradox. You know, your entropy calculations show the information should be out, but it obviously isn't. It's obviously still inside. Um, so what we'd like is a way to do a calculation, calculates what an operator acting on the Hawking radiation does, just using a path integral, and to magically find that actually what it's doing is, is measuring the interior or manipulating the interior or something like that. Um, so that was our second major goal for this paper. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. It's section three of our paper. Uh, sections four to seven, I guess, we're not going to cover. I think Steve is going to cover section seven in his talk. Um, you're going to be getting a lot of this paper this week. Uh, but what we're going to find is that, just like for the page curve, there's going to be a really crucial role played by Euclidean wormholes connecting different space times. This time, however, they're going to be very slightly different. Okay, before the Euclidean wormholes were connecting different replicas that were used in this replica trick entropy calculation. Now, at least at some level, what's going to be happening is that to do this measurement on the Hawking radiation, we're going to have to do some very complicated quantum computation. It's a very complicated measurement. If we want to turn it into a simple measurement, we need to use an amazingly powerful quantum computer. And that quantum computer 
is effectively going to be doing calculations that are equivalent to simulating the entire black hole system. And somehow, there are going to be Euclidean wormholes connecting the real black hole to the simulated black hole in the quantum computer. At least that's one way of describing the picture. And that is totally crazy. Um, but the maths works, so yeah. Um, you, you guys can see what you think of it at the end of this talk. Uh, OK, so let's actually get on to what we're going to do. So ooh, I didn't want to do that. So the states Douglas was considering in his talk uh, were states on a theory of pure JT gravity, so no degrees of freedom except for an end of the world brain. And the end of the world brain carried degrees of freedom, but those degrees of freedom were maximally entangled with the auxiliary reference system. So in that state, there's sort of not really any degrees of freedom that are left in the interior that we could hope to reconstruct from the Hawking radiation. So we need to change something to, to, to give us some things to find out, to give, to give us some, some things we naively shouldn't know about in the interior, but actually we do because of, of the magic of this entanglement wedge reconstruction. So what we're going to do is we're just going to add, for the moment, some extra degrees of freedom sitting on this end of the world brain. OK? So I'm going to label those degrees of freedom just to distinguish them from the ones that are maximally entangled with the Hawking radiation by A. The original ones are I, new ones are A, and we're going to allow them to be in any state that we want. But fundamentally, these are not a different type of degrees of freedom. I've just split them into two parts because we're going to treat them differently in our calculations. So now we're going to consider states, whereas before we just had maximally entangled between some over psi i, where i was the state of a black hole with the end of the world brain in state i, and that was entangled with reference system in state i. Now the black hole is described by both i and a. So this now gives us an entire code space of different states that we can have, which are spanned by these states psi a, where we have the end of the world brain, have state, I on these, state a on these extra degrees of freedom. OK, so that's going to be the model I'm going to focus on for most of this talk. We, you, know, you can do much more general things than that, and we do in the paper, and I'm going to talk about that in the end. OK, but for the moment, we're just going to take this as the setup. And now we want to show that these extra degrees of freedom that are sitting in the interior of the black hole and so are in this island are secretly encoded in the Hawking radiation. Let's make that aim a bit more explicit. OK? What we want to be able to do is let's say we have any operator that acts on these extra degrees of freedom, A. I, it's, a, it's an operator, just act, bulk operator acting on the end of the world brain. What we want to show is that there always exists some other operator, OR, that acts only on the Hawking radiation system, R, that does the same thing. In other words, its matrix element, we look at psi A, OR, psi B, it's exactly the same as the bulk matrix elements of this operator here for the corresponding states. So the first question we have to ask is, what operator should we use here? OK, it's, it's not at all clear. There's a, there's a lot of different operators that, in principle, could do the job. Um, what we're going to use is something called the PETS map reconstruction. And this is a word that, for whatever reason, seems to scare high energy people because it feels very, very quantum information y. Um, I want to try and convince you that this is the stupidest thing you could do that isn't so stupid it just won't work. OK? So what is this operator? <laughs> its definition is the thing that scares people. It's a bit of a mess. First thing we do is we just take our bulk matrix elements and we sandwich them with a psi A and a psi B. OK, this is basically just mapping out these bulk matrix elements into the boundary state. So this is obviously something that's going to do the job we want, right? It's uh, pretty easy to see that this thing 
satisfies this, since our states psi a and psi b are orthogonal. But now we want to turn it into an operator. That operator acts on both the reference system and the black hole B. So now we want to turn it into an operator acting only on the reference system B. What's the simplest thing that you could do to turn an operator acting on both B and R into something acting on only R? You just trace out, you do a partial trace over B. The slightly weirder thing that we do is that we then sandwich it with two factors of sigma r to the minus a half, where sigma r here is basically we take the maximally mixed state in this code space spanned by psi a's, and then we take its reduced state on r. So why do we do that? Well, let's look at what this operator does, assuming there's some operator that works. What we're going to show is that if any operator does the job we want it to, i.e. it satisfies that equation up there, then this one will. OK? Why is that? It turns out, and I think one of the best explanations of this is given in paper by Dan Harlow on quantum error correction in the Ryotaki-Nagi formula, that if any operator exists that satisfies that formula, then it must be the case that there is some isomorphism splitting HR into two subsystems, R1 and R2. And when rewritten in terms of those subsystems, it will always be the case that each state psi, I, psi A just looks like a, the state A on the subsystem R1. The dimension of R1 is H code, tensored with some fixed state chi on R2 and B that does not depend on A. OK? So morally, what this is, is saying is that the, the A dependence of the state is all stuck in subsystem R. Subsystem B doesn't care at all about what the particular state in the code space is. Let's assume that this is the case. We can then just evaluate this whole messy formula. What does this OAB psi A psi B give? Well, it's just OAB a and B, which is just our, our operator on the bulk code space, tensored with this fixed state chi on R2 and B. Sorry? Yes? Shouldn't there in general be decoding unitaries between uh, psi A, R, B equals U times A, R, C, R, 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 R,
we don't know whether anything works, except by these sort of indirect quantum information arguments. So what we want to do is just evaluate this PETS operator and see what it does, and hopefully it does the thing we wanted it to. OK. So I've now just written out what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate matrix elements of OR, and we're going to try and show that they're equal in the right limit to OAB. So this thing is written out here. It's quite long. It's quite messy. But the big problem with it is that it has these sigma r to the minus a halves. And I don't know about you, but I don't know how to evaluate something to the minus a half using a path integral. Fortunately, great minds before us have basically already answered the question of what to do when you have uh, density matrices to non-integer powers. You just forget about the fact that they're non-integer, pretend that they are integer, and in this case also a non-negative integer, n. And then at the end, when you get your final answer, we're just going to plug in n equals minus a half. And we're going to ignore the fact that none of that really makes sense because you can't have minus a half extra replicas. OK. So can now evaluate this whole messy thing, and I have done it here for you. OK, let's try and unpack a bit how this works. This bit here is just preparing this state. Sorry, this bit here is preparing this state psi b. OK, I've actually flipped my a's and b's around here. I'd normally like to start at the bottom. Never mind. Uh, so we, this thing is preparing the state psi b. We're now going to act. This is the system R. This is the system B. For the moment, we're not going to do anything to system B. We're going to forget about it. We're going to come back to it at the end. We're going to apply operators to system R. What are those operators? They're going to be n powers of this matrix sigma R. OK? What is that matrix? Well, we just got to let's write this out explicitly. Trace over b, sum over b1, psi b1, psi b1. This is equal to sum over i, i, i. And then we've got to do the trace over b, so that gives us an inner product. We get psi i b prime, psi i b prime. And we have a sum over i and v prime here. So we have our i index sitting here. We then glue in a JT gravity boundary. This is the psi i b prime, psi i b prime. And we have boundary conditions so that the end of the world brain sitting here has to have the i indices in the state that's uh, got from this, this dotted line. And the, the a index is going to be in bn. Is that clear? And then we have to have the same bn at the other side over here. And we have a new i that's going to go on to the next operator. It's a ket. OK, and then we sum over bn. So we have n of these things. And then we, so that's our sigma r to the n. Then we get to this thing. OK, this thing is almost exactly the same, except rather than just a sum over b prime here, we have a sum over a prime and b prime, and we have an O, a prime, b prime. OK, this is just literally writing out this formula as boundary conditions for a path integral. So we have an a prime here, b prime here, an a prime here, and we're multiplying the whole thing at the end by O, a prime, b prime, and then we're going to sum over it. And now we have another sigma r to the n. So this is another n boundaries that work exactly the same way as the ones on the top. And finally, we have this psi a. So finally, this b system here that's been dangling this whole time is going to get back involved. OK, and we're going to close the thing off with a path integral that just looks like the complex conjugate of the thing we started with. So this entire thing is the boundary path integral. And then to evaluate it using a, a sorry, this is the boundary conditions for a gravitational path integral. If we want to evaluate it, we just need a sum over all topologies. I should say one final comment. You have this stuff out the front just says so correctly normalized. 2n plus 2 boundaries, each of them has to be normalized. 
And we know that when k is very, very, very large, way bigger than e to the s naught, the dominant topology for something like this is exactly the same one we had before. It's a fully connected n boundary Euclidean wormhole. The O is just multiplying. As I've written it now, these O A prime B primes, they're just matrix elements. So it's, I'm just, it's just saying you evaluate this path integral, and then you multiply it by O A prime B prime. And then at the end, we're going to sum over A prime, and we're going to sum over B prime. OK, so that's how the O is going to get involved in the whole thing. OK, so just to remind you, though Douglas explained it very well in his talk, probably better than me, the reason this topology dominates is because it take, creates 2n plus 2 separate index loops for this auxiliary reference system. Okay, And each of those contributes a factor of k. And k is really, really huge. So the bulk path integral just wants as many of them as possible, preferentially over everything else. And then given those conditions, it's then determined by what has the, the smallest Euler, sorry, yes, largest Euler characteristic, and that's this connected disk topology. So let's evaluate this thing. We first have to evaluate the gravitational part of the action. Okay? This is just what Douglas called Z2n plus 2. It's just the action for a gravitational path integral with 2n plus 2 boundaries. We now have to normalize it. We'll just take that thing out the front and put it here. Of k to 2n plus 2, z1 to the 2n plus 2. We now want to look at the contribution from all these loops. OK, each of these, these loops in the, in the auxiliary reference system gives us a factor of k. We have 2n plus 2 of them, so that gives a factor of k to the 2n plus 2. Finally, we have to worry about this extra degree of freedom, A. OK? That, again, has no dynamics on this end of the world brain. So we get a factor of delta A, A1, from the fact that this end of the end of the world brain needs to have the same index as this end. We get a factor of delta A1, A2, from the fact that these ones need to be the same, and so on, up to An. So we find that An is also equal to A. And then finally, from this one, we find that A prime is equal to An is equal to A. So all these sums are just going to go away. Well, the sums over A at any rate, and we're just going to find A prime equals A. And exactly the same thing. This B index is carried all the way around through the end of the world brains and the fact that these boundary conditions say it have to be the same to make sure that B prime is equal to B. So we just get a factor of O, A, B, and all the sums go away. So now we have this formula. Have to do what I said we were going to do at the very beginning, which is we're now just going to take this formula and we're going to substitute in n equals minus a half. These k's on top and bottom, we already know cancel. We have a z, 2n plus 2 over z1 to the 2n plus 2, when n equals minus a half, 2n plus 2 equals minus 1 by algebra. And we find everything cancels <laughs> except for OAB. So we finally get the answer. It's this incredibly simple answer that all that this brutally complicated operator has done, all this power of it, it's just ended up applying the bulk operator we want to do, and it hasn't done anything else at all. Just to emphasize that it's non-trivial, that it worked out like this, I'm now going to say, what about when k is too small? Right? When k is small, we don't want this to work. When k is small, what's going to dominate? It's going to be the disconnected phase. Okay? Instead of wanting as many k loops as possible, it now wants to have as large an Euler characteristic as possible to get the highest factor of e to the s naught. And that's going to come from having all these independent space times. 
OK, what do we get now? Well, we have 2n plus 2 copies of z1. So that cancels out with these things. We have one big loop of k. So we get a k over k to the 2n plus 2. Then we get a factor of this one's connected to this one. So we get delta ab. Each of these can just be anything, so they get summed over. So we get a factor of decode to the 2n. And finally, we get a factor of, we have to sum over a prime and b prime. It gets multiplied by o. And so, sorry, we get a delta a prime, b prime, because they're connected by an end of the world brain. So we just get a trace of o code. And now I plug in n equals minus a half. And what I get is the factors of k cancel out, get a delta OB over D code times trace of O code. So now this reconstruction has completely failed. It has learned absolutely nothing about what it was meant to be learning, which was what the hell is going on with these states A and B. Okay? Instead, it's just acting as the identity in the interior, and we're just getting something proportional to the trace. Uh, say this again. So, can you repeat the question? I, yeah, that, that would be, I would count that as the calculating entropies and then using the hammer of quantum information. It will, it will certainly work. You will get the right answer. You can conclude that, uh, yeah, you, you, you must be able to learn about the interior. But in this point of view, we're literally seeing the, the thing learning about the interior happening in front of our eyes. That's the cool thing about it. It's just, we're directly looking at what's happening in the bulk and the, the end of the world brain is being pulled out through these Euclidean wormholes, and it's getting manipulated, and it's getting put back in, and somehow all the stuff that happened to it gets forgotten except for the fact that it got manipulated. OK. So as in Douglas's talk, the really amazing thing about this toy, the toy model is that you can actually just evaluate everything in it. Um, and so we're not limited to saying, well, this thing dominates or this thing dominates, and then you analytically continue. We can take the full sum over all the topologies that could possibly matter, and then we can effectively analytically continue that sum. Um, so how do we do that? The first thing to note is that there's basically two types of topologies for this calculation. There's topologies that somehow, where somehow, by however many steps it takes, this thing gets connected to this thing. So this would be an example. And then there's other examples. There's the, the other case is the topologies where it doesn't get connected. So maybe this thing just gets closed off, and this thing maybe gets connected to here. It has some complicated stuff going on, but it never reaches all the way to here. It's pretty easy to see that the first type give answers that are proportional to OAB. They're what we want. The second type give the same answer as the disconnected case, something proportional to trace O code. So they're the ones that fail. And it turns out that just by evaluating the trace of this operator, it's easy to see that, C, as I've written them, C1 and C2 have to add up to 1. So all we need to do, calculate C1 for particular numbers of boundaries up here on the top and bottom. I'm going to allow them to be different now. I'm going to allow them to be N1 and N2 that aren't necessarily the same. And then analytically continue to minus a half. And the way we're going to do that, because that's sort of non-trivial, there's different numbers of terms in the sum. Michael, you seem to have a question. <laughs> oh, you were just, OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is we're going to use the same trick we used before of instead, we're going to evaluate sum over all n1 and n2 with appropriate powers of lambda 1 and lambda 2 at the front. OK, this is exactly the same trick we used to calculate the page curve. And then, as before, by uh, doing a contour integral and having an appropriate power of lambda to extract the pole we want as a residue, then we're going to be able to eventually get the answer we want. 
And this thing, we can evaluate. How can we evaluate it? We can expand out the diagrams as follows. We count them by the number of things in between the original space time and the space time where the operator is applied on the top and bottom. We're going to call the ones on the top. We're going to say there's m1 ones on the top and m2 on the bottom. OK? Once we've done that, all the other stuff in between is just going to give a factor of r, where r is the thing that Douglas calculated in his previous talk. Right? That's because they're not connected at all to, to these things where something's complicated happens. So it's just the same sort of cycle thing that we, we had when we were calculating the page curve. So we can write this with a load of factors of r, m1 and m2 respectively. And then, because the formulas are particularly nice, it ends up being a geometric series in the same way. We can do the full sum, then do this contour integral with n equals a half. We have to deform the contour in the same way we did before, but it all works out the same way Douglas said. And we get an answer. That's this. It's pretty complicated. Can't be solved exactly, but it uh, is the exact answer for the probability that the page uh, reconstruction works. And we can solve this approximately. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Let's get rid of this. Yes. <laughs> I blame Ahmed going for sabotage things by telling me I was writing too smallly, small to distract me because of them being the competition. Um, <laughs> In particular, it turns out there's good approximate answers given in two regimes. During the, tra during the praise transition, when we're somewhere where k is pretty comparable to e to the s naught, turns out the answer for how well the page curve works is basically given by this formula, which can be interpreted as the probability that the page transition has happened. Because it's a thermal state, there's fluctuations in energy. That means there's, when you're near the transition, there's some probability that k is bigger than the black hole entropy, and some probability is less. This formula basically says you know, it works if the energy is sufficiently small so that we're past the page transition. After the page transition, there's a formula that's more complicated, and I'm not going to write down. But it turns out that this thing would decay too quickly. This thing would decay as like the difference between the, the log k and the entropy of the black hole squared, and then take e to the minus that. And there was paper by me and Patrick a year ago that said that couldn't possibly happen. The fastest it could decay is exponentially with that difference. And in fact, you can do the calculation properly, include perturbative corrections to R, and you get exactly that answer. And the final thing I want to say about this is that you'll notice in the formula up there, k never appears on its own. Instead, it appears as k over decode. So what this means is if we make decode too big, if we don't, know enough, don't have a small enough code space, then we're effectively making k smaller. And if we make k sm too small, then we're not past the page transition, and we can't do the reconstruction. Um, so this is saying that the reconstruction of the interior in the Hawking radiation is state dependent. This was known going back to Hayden Preskill. Um, there's a lot of stuff I've written about it. So it's very cool from my point of view to have this very, very explicit formula for what the area is. Um, but yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. I just want to take the last two minutes that I have to say something somewhat more general, which is how this applies for general entanglement wedge reconstruction. And I'm not actually going to do general entanglement wedge reconstruction, because it requires greater artistic skills than I possess. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this exact same theory. But rather than having these degrees of freedom A just be extra degrees of freedom on the end of the world brain, I'm going to make the degrees of freedom A be boundary conditions for some bulk field theory that we're going to add in to the theory. OK? So these boundary conditions are going to create some state. It's going to be some state of some fields that may be partially in the interior and maybe partially in the exterior. And what I want to understand is what this PEDS map will do in that case. OK? 
So to do this, we're not going to be able to do the full sum and resumming and lambda and stuff like that. I'm just going to assume k is very large, and so the connected topology dominates. Then what I'm going to do, so I'm going to divide, ooh, I need to make it be the connected topology that's disconnected. I'm going to divide this multi-boundary wormhole up into 2n plus 2 pieces that are going to be, there's a 2n plus 2 replica symmetry here, and I'm going to divide it up based on the action of that symmetry. OK? So we've now split up the integral into a piece associated with each of these 2n plus 2 boundaries. And there's an angle here at the, the center that is 2 pi over 2n plus 2. I'm running out of time, but the great thing about n equals minus a half is that 2 pi over 2n plus 2 when n equals minus a half is 2 pi. Um, and what that ends up meaning is that each of these chunks is just an unback reacted copy of the original space time, except with a cut. I'm going to go draw it over here. Right, this dotted line is just going to start from the horizon, or more generally, from the RT surface or EW surface or whatever you have. It's going to cut out the space time there. OK? And so this corresponds in the field theory to the reduced state of the field theory on the interior of the black hole. We traced out over the exterior of the black hole, and we're just looking at the reduced state on the interior. And when you do that, and you look at this whole thing, what you find is that the resulting operator is a PETS map in the field theory. It's taking the field theory bulk operator and doing a PETS map to like, make it an operator that acts only on the interior of the black hole, or more generally, only in the entanglement wedge. So I'll write that out explicitly. It looks like sigma to the minus a half trace over out of like the operator in the field theory, sigma to the minus a half on the inside. But we know the PETS map works whenever all the information in the operator is acting in the stuff you kept, right? If our operator is acting entirely in the inside, then this thing just reproduces a field theory, because when we do the trace out and then we normalize with these sigmas to the minus a half, we haven't done anything. We haven't lost any information. Our operator only acts in the inside. OK? And so that's a much more general story that is true for the two-interval case. It's too true for whatever you want. Uh, and yeah, just evaluate by bulk path integral with the PETS map, and it does the thing you want it to do. Um, but the most exciting thing is that when you do it on the Hawking radiation, it acts in the interior of the black hole. OK, that's all I have. Thanks.